Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Govin. Um, I'm going to be in 12th grade next year and I'm from Houston, Texas and um, currently I'm working in a learning algorithms lab at the University of Houston. So this is my case study on using 3D convolutional neural networks uh, with visual insights for classification of lung nodules and early detection of lung cancer. So the question is, how can deep learning methods be used to solve high impact medical problems such as lung cancer detection? And more specifically, how can we use 3D convolutional neural networks in this specific application for detection of lung cancer? And another problem um, everyone probably knows since you're all ML practitioners is that no matter how good your deep learning model is, if it's not interpretable to people in the domain, it's really hard for them to adopt it. So ML models recently, they've been known to have very good accuracies, especially deep learning models specifically. But if the domain expert can't trust the model, then it doesn't mean as much because it really won't gain adoption. So the idea is, how can we use techniques such as gradient weighted class activation mapping or GradCam to visualize the model's decision making and increase radiologist trust and improve adoption in the field? So just some background on the problem. Uh, lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer death among um, both men and women in the United States. And this is around even more than 100,000 deaths a year in the US alone. So it's a pretty big scale problem. And one of the reasons, or sorry, let me. All right. The five year survival rate is also only 17%. So when we look at why the survival rate is so low, what we find is that early detection can really improve the chances of survival. However, many times by the time the lung nodule or the cancer is detected, it's already too late in the um, process for intervention and um, good treatment to happen. So the idea is that early detection of malignant lung nodules can significantly improve the chances of survival and prognosis. And the problem with this is that detection of lung nodules is quite time consuming and difficult due to the volume of data involved. So there can be, and as well as interradiologist variants. So what this means is that since the CT scan data is so huge, it has millions of voxels, the lung nodule is pretty tiny compared to the size of that CT scan data. So the problem is, is that uh, one radiologist might see it and classify this as a nodule, while another radiologist might not even see the same thing. So there's some subjectivity in interradiologist variance, and then the nature of the problem is, is that it's kind of hard to find the nodule in the first place. It's almost like trying to find a needle in a haystack. So to approach this, um, I'll give some more background first. So computed tomography, or CT, is widely used for lung cancer screening. And the goal is to see, as early as possible, can we detect that this disease is here. Um, An accurate detection is quite important to the diagnosis of lung cancer. But as I said before, a CT scan can have millions of voxels. And out of these, a lung nodule is quite small and hard to detect. So this is quite the significant challenge for radiologists today. And so what happened is that automated methods recently have shown better accuracies or even comparable accuracies to manual interpretation by radiologists. And in addition to this, they can reduce subjectivity and interradiologist variance. So as I talked about before, one radiologist might classify this as a nodule, another might classify it as something else. And then this variance can lead to many problems. So the idea is that using automated methods can reduce the subjectivity significantly and improve um, diagnosis. Um, so more recently, deep neural nets have shown superior performance in classification problems. And deep neural nets are things such as 2D convolutional neural networks. So what these do is that they'll look at a slice of the CT scan. Normally CT scan data is 3D, so it'll have many different slices. So what a 2D CNN or convolutional neural network can do is it can look at a singular slice of this data and then it'll classify this as having a nodule or not. And further um, upon this approach is using a combination of multiple 2D CNNs from multiple angles of that CT scan data. And then that can allow for higher accuracies. So obviously, like 2D CNNs are one approach, but 3D CNNs um, that use the full nature of the 3D data instead of the 2D data are, should have 
higher accuracies in specifically low knowledge detection task. And you can think about this from the human perspective to get a better idea. So when a radiologist looks at these 2D scans, they'll look at a bunch of 2D scans in order. And this gives them like a more 3D view of the CT scan. And what this allows them to do is give a better diagnosis of whether or not there's a lung nodule there or not. So the same thing applies to convolutional neural nets in that if they can see the full 3D nature of the data, the idea is, is that they can get a higher accuracy in detecting these lung nodules. So I'll go into a little bit of background on the different um, ML methods and then deep learning as well. So this is an example of what like a singular neuron looks like in an artificial neural network. And the full neural network will have many of these neurons. And so the idea behind a neural net is that it's modeled to be similar to a human brain. So the neuron will take many different inputs, apply some weight to that input, um, combine all of those inputs together, and then put them to, um, through some activation function. And then this will propagate among further neurons. And then it'll be a full network of singular neurons like this. So this kind of artificial neural network approach has shown a lot of promise in many data sets. However, when we get to image data sets, it's a completely different issue. So traditional neural nets will look like this with input layers and then hidden layers in between. And finally, an output layer that makes a prediction as to what we're looking for. In this case, is it a lung nodule or not, or any generic task like that. So the problem here is that they're not really suited for image processing for a multitude of reasons, which I'll go through. Um, number one is that images have a lot of pixels. And as such, there will be a lot of weights in the neural net, which means that, um, number one, it's just computationally very expensive because there's so many weights. So it's just not viable. And in addition to this, since there's so many weights, overfitting can occur. Um, being ML practitioners, you probably know about how big of a challenge overfitting can be. So it's obviously not ideal to have an architecture that's prone to overfitting. And uh, one of the most important things is that the spatial information image isn't accounted for by an artificial neural net. So um, what happens here is we think about a new architecture called the convolutional neural network. So basically what a CNN is, it consists of the input and output like any other deep learning method. And it'll have layers called convolutional layers and mass pooling layers. So I'll go through this further in the next few slides. But the general idea is, is that the input will go through a series of convolutional and mass pooling layers. And then this will map to some fully connected layers at the end, which map to an output. So you may not know, understand what that means, but I'll go through a little bit deeper. So a convolutional layer will take in some input. Um, it'll consist of kernels or filters. Um, either word is fine. And basically what happens here is that this kernel will convolve over the input. So it'll start um, all the way at the left. And it'll convolve. It'll go to the next layer, next layer, and then Basically, what happens is that the dot product is taken between the kernel and the input. And this outputs to some feature map like this. So the idea is, is that these convolutional layers are able to detect certain features in the image. So if you have an image of the face, the idea is, is that the earlier convolutional layers can detect the edges, the, the little um, edges on the face. And then later on, the later convolutional layers can detect certain parts of the face, maybe the eyes or the nose. And finally, the last few layers will detect the entire face. So this is the main um, layer that makes up um, the convolutional neural network. But another critical layer is also the max pooling layers. So max pooling layers basically take the max value in a certain area, and they'll pull it into a singular value. So to give you an idea, like these four picked, um, from the feature map here, are mats pooled into this singular pixel, singular feature right here. So the idea behind a mats pooling layer is that you reduce the dimensions of the data. And this allows for quicker computation. And we talked about the overfitting problem earlier, where in a traditional neural, um, neural net, overfitting is quite the problem because there's so many input features. So what you do is that when you mats pool like this, it allows for the general network to generalize better. And it won't overfit the data as much. And this is really good because it allows for higher accuracies. And finally, um, using the max value allows for better feature detection um, from max pooling. So the idea is, is that a full network will consist of many convolutional layers um, interspaced with max pooling layers, which 
as I said, reduce dimensions, um, allow for better computational speed, and reduce overfitting. So each CNN layer has features of increasing complexity. And the first layer, as I said, learn edges, corners, things like that. And then as you go further, um, the intermediate layers will learn more complex parts of the object. Um, in the face example, maybe like eyes, nose, things such as that. And finally, the last layers will um, detect full objects such as faces. And so the idea is that um, these CNNs will have convolutional layers, match pulling layers, and finally it'll output to some decision made, uh, layer. And that's just the general idea of how 2D CNNs are. Um, 3D CNNs are essentially the same thing, except your input, your input will be 3D data like this. Instead of being a singular layer, it'll be a volume. And then your kernels, this is the key part, your kernels or your filters will also be 3D. So what this means is that instead of detecting 2D features such as edges and corners, it will detect the same features but in a 3D fashion, which is really critical, um, especially in this lung nodule case, because all the data is of a 3D nature. Yeah. So you can use a 3D data or you can use a video? Yeah, so, so video is like time series um, type data, so that's a little bit of a different approach. So, um, but in this case, yeah, you could do 3D data, and then um, time series data also works as well. It's just a little um, architecture modification. So the idea is, is that this 3D data is inputted. Um, it goes through some 3D kernels, and then it's classified as either healthy or diseased. In this case, lung nodule exists in that CT image, or lung nodule does not exist. So in addition to this, like I said, um, CNNs, like other deep neural networks, have been black boxes giving users no intuition as to how they're predicting, yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. So, yeah, and feel free to ask questions at any time. I'd like this to be interactive so that I can answer your questions. Um, so this kernel right here, so normally, let me just go back a little bit. Um, yeah, so normally we'd have a 2D input, right? just an X by Y array. And the kernel is also 2D, so it'll just be two-dimensional. And the dot product is, this, this convolves over the um, input, and then the dot product is taken, and this outputs to some feature map like this. So the idea with a 3D is that everything will be 3D instead of being 2D. So you can just think of the input as having just many stacked arrays. So like it'll have many arrays behind it as well, which 3D nature. and this this kernel or filter right here will also be 3D. So it'll just have the weight or the kernel or the input, they're all the same thing. Um, yeah, you might hear me use these words interchangeably. Uh, kernel, um, filter, and weight all mean the same thing. So the, the kernel that convolves over the input data will also be 3D. So what this means is that it does a better job at detecting these 3D features that may not otherwise be seen in a 2D, um, 2D input with a 2D kernel. change the, so the kernels are like essentially what's updated over multiple iterations. So in a traditional neural net, you'd have um, certain weights that you'd update. So I'll show you. Yeah, so you'd have, you'd have these weights that you'll update after every iteration. But in this case, we replace these weights with the kernel. So the kernels would change over, um, over multiple iterations. They're essentially what's being optimized to reduce the loss and optimize the, the network. So, exactly. Yeah, so it's essentially just a weight matrix, but instead of traditional weights that are just numbers, it's an array that is convolved. And then the kernels themselves say the same. The same kernel gets across the whole image, but you're updating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the kernel will also be 3D. So it'll have depth as well. So the idea is that by adding this depth, it's pretty much just the same way. You're trying to mimic what a human is seeing. So when a radiologist looks at it, he looks at um, multiple layers together to get a 3D view of what exactly is going on. So the same way, um, by making the kernel 3D and making the input 3D, we're trying to maximize, exploit the 3D nature of the CT scan so you're not losing any spatial information. 
and that's why you're supposed to, or you should get a higher accuracy by using this 3D approach. Yeah, they'll move in all three directions. So what the research you're learning, so it's a 2D images, we are learning spatial models. Yeah. So in the 3D, what the extra features you're learning? So the idea is that it's still spatial information, but if you look at a LUN module, like in reality, it's going to be some spherical type of thing. So when you look at it in a 2D fashion, it'll be like a circle, right? So a circle is probably harder to detect than like a sphere in a 3D data. So when you look for this like edges that are like almost like spherical, it's easier to detect versus like a circle in a 2D nature data. So the idea is that since the data itself is in 3D, when you map over to 2D, you're naturally going to lose some information, some spatial information, some information that can be critical for detecting the nodule. So when you make it 3D data, you're trying to minimize whatever information you're losing so that you can really get a better idea of what you're looking for and look for it um, with a higher accuracy. Like it's a 2D humans, you should know where the object is or something. Yeah. Yeah, so it's still the same edges, but the edges will be 3D, right? Like when I when I look at you and see your face, I see I have depth perception, right? So like I can differentiate someone's head versus like a circle. So like that's the depth perception that I get because I have that 3D um, 3D view of someone. So that I can when I look at someone's face, I see the edges, but I see them in a 3D nature. I see the depth perception. I see that your nose has depth, your eyes have depth. The same way, the idea is that this model can exploit that. 3D nature of the LUN module data and acquire higher accuracies. Yeah, so different people have thought of like different approaches. I've tried both of them. Uh, what I've found is that um, most of the time, Matt's pooling seems to do a better job of detecting features. At the same time, what I've heard is that average pooling can generalize better. So it's generally like a trade-off. You can try both of them. Um, these are things that are usually optimized over iterations. Usually you'll validate on a validation data set and see what seems to be performing better. Am I overfitting too much? Do I need to change average pooling, max pooling? These are all things that are part of the network architecture that um, the idea is that over multiple iterations, when you validate, you want to see how changing these features can really improve my accuracy or how is it changing what I'm seeing. So. What I found for this project is that Matt's pulling seemed to do better at detecting some of the features. So that's what I went with. And most of the projects I've seen, Matt's pulling seems to perform better. So yeah, that's the, that's the idea. So while training time, the 2D itself is take time. So if it's a case of 3D images, so the training time will be a maybe increase. Yeah, so training time, yeah. So if you have 3D, it will increase. So um, I know GPU training usually doesn't have too much of a problem training fast. In this specific case, what I did is that, number one, I downscaled the data to improve training speed. And also, um, I tried using lightweight models. So if you use a model with 100, 200 layers, you might have problems with training time, especially if you're training on a CPU with limited resources, um, which in this case I was doing. So what I did is that I used a pretty lightweight model, um, which still had good accuracy in this specific problem, as well as downsizing the data. And then also, um, if you have problems like um, in terms of training time, one idea is to um, just decrease data size. Um, and then, yeah, so AlexNet I used as my, I'll go into this further. Um, I think it's better if I move on because I'm, these are all stuff I'm going to cover on um, later in the slides, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so I think this is where I was. So. Um, yeah, so one of the big problems about deep neural nets and deep learning approaches is that while they have high accuracies, um, it's really hard for domain experts to accept what they're predicting because they give no intuition. And this is one of the general themes that I've noticed like across all of ML and even um, in the past few days I've been at the conference, what I've noticed is that a lot of people have been approaching this problem in different ways. So as I said, superior results in test conditions, but Real life adoption is not as easy because of lack of transparency in the models. So the idea here is that um, I thought maybe we can approach this problem using gradient weighted class activation mapping or GradCam. So 
Um, how many in the audience know it or have used GradCam or know about GradCam? All right, so a few of you. So I'll, I'll go further into um, what exactly GradCam is. But the idea is that we can use this um, algorithm to provide visual explanations by highlighting discriminative regions in the model. So this is a very um, powerful approach for figuring how we can make the model interpretable for people in the domain. So the idea here is that the study aims to build a 3D CNN with state-of-the-art accuracy, but also provide visual insights into how exactly the model is making its decision. And this will allow for better trust and adoption in the field. And in addition to this, like I was saying before, you want to validate your model and update it across the debugging and optimization process. So the idea is that if we can look at these visual insights, we can see where the model is failing, why the model is failing, and we can address this by changing the architecture of the model. And to my knowledge, this is the first study that demonstrates grad cam techniques for visual explanations on lung module classification. So this is really the value added here with this study. So the objective here is to research and develop 3D CNNs to detect lung nodules in CT scan data with better accuracy and higher trust than existing models. And this is to ultimately aid in early detection of lung cancer to improve chances of survival and prognosis. Yeah, so the research questions are just derived from that same objective. Can we prove that a 3D CNN can do better than 2D CNN to detecting lung nodules? And also, is it possible to derive visual explanations for the internal workings using GradCam methods? So we hypothesize that 3D CNNs, which can exploit the full 3D nature of the data, will have better accuracy. And that GradCam algorithm can provide visual explanations for decisions in um, lung nodule um, problem by highlighting discriminative regions. Exactly. Exactly, with the same model type. Mm -hmm, with the same model type. And then also, can we improve upon that using some optimization? I'll also cover that as well. So I'll go a little bit into the data that I use. So we used uh, the Luna 16 data set, which has almost 900 um, thoracic CT scans. And um, this data set is pretty clean as already from the start. So the scans with slices greater than three millimeters were removed. And one of the reasons for this is that um, the lung nodule is pretty small from the start. So if you have slices greater than three millimeters, you might miss the nodule altogether. So that's some of the pre-processing that was already done. And then um, images were annotated by four experienced radiologists. So the idea here is that you want to have a golden standard. So uh, we talked about how this problem suffers from interradiologist variants. So the idea to approach this is that by having a panel of radiologists discuss each image and then label it, you can have a golden standard for what is actually being seen in that image. Um, and then each radiologist marked lesions as a nodule uh, or a non-nodule. And the reference standard is that at least three out of four radiologists must identify it as a nodule greater than or equal to three millimeters for it to be labeled as a nodule in the data. So this is how the data looks. Um, basically, this was full CT scans that were then chopped up into where exactly um, they identified as nodule or non-nodules. Um, so the idea here is that this is a nodule right here, this is a nodule right here, and this is a nodule over here. So obviously, um, I'm not a radi radiologist. I don't know if any of you are also radiologists, but it's kind of hard to tell on some of these images what exactly there is, and that's, that's where the problem lies, right? So in this case, like, this looks like some amorphous blob that's in the, in the picture, but we can't really tell if that's a nodule or not. In this case, it's labeled as a non-nodule, but as someone who's not a radiologist, it's really hard to tell. So that's the, that's the idea. There's the problem of false positives as well as the problem of not even detecting the nodule. So these are twin problems that are, we're aiming to address using the deep learning approach. So this is the study design. So the idea is that first we gather and pre-process data. Then we split the data into training and testing data sets as well as validation. Um, we design and implement a model. We train that model. Um, validate that model on the validation data set, and we iterate through this process right here. So based on how our model is performing, we can uh, change the architecture, we can put in match pooling instead of average pooling, we can add more layers, change the filter sizes, how many filters there are. So a lot of, this is the job of the data scientist basically. Basically iterate through this, 
and figure out how exactly we can make the model as good as possible. And then we evaluate on our test data set. So the idea here is that the test data set can only be used once because you don't want to train for your test data set or optimize your model for your test data set. The idea is that we hold out a test data set to be used at the very end only once. And finally, we visualize the model using GradCam. So this is for higher interpretability, and the idea is to gain adoption in the field. So first, um, splitting and pre-processing the data. So um, out of this 900 CT scans, we cut down to 1,000 nodule and 1,000 non-nodule volumes. And this is divided into three, tests, uh, three sets for training, validation, and testing. So the data was completely randomized. Um, and 1,400 images were used for training and 600 for testing. And 10% of the training data, or 140 volumes, were used for validation. So I'll go a little bit into the architecture and implementation. So I used the AltNet architecture as the baseline. And I also optimized the 3D CNN over many iterations. So the AltNet architecture is um, probably the architecture that made CNNs popular in the first place. Um, it did very good on some baseline measures and then it's what caused like an explosion in this whole field of image classification using CNNs. So the architecture is pretty um, pretty small and the idea here is that you can reduce your computational load. So it has about five convolutional layers followed by three fully connected layers. And um, my 3D CNN is also pretty similar. It has an extra layer. And also what I did over many opt um, iterations is that I increased the number of filters and the filter sizes early on and funneled it down more dramatically than Alitinet does towards the end of the network. And I believe that in this specific problem, that may have helped um, find some features that Alitinet might have missed. So this is just some model summaries that were output. Um, it's probably hard to read, but um, yeah, let me just continue. So now I'll go into the training process. So the training process is basically some images X are input into the model, and then this model makes some predictions and then these output or the predictions is compared with the actual, the actual value of the label, which is y. And some loss function is computed. So this loss function says, how far away are we from where we want to be? And how can we minimize this loss so that this model is updated and is better at predicting what we're trying to do? So the optimization of this loss function is basically where we update the model with new parameters. And in this case, um, as we talked about before, the new parameters would be the values inside of the kernels, as we were speaking about earlier, as opposed to traditional weights in an artificial neural network. Um, so during the training process, a soft mat activation function was used um, before loss was calculated. And cross entropy was used as the loss function to be optimized. And all of the models used Atom optimizer um, with default parameters and a learning rate of 0 0.0001. So all of these things are different things that can be changed in and out. Um, like for, you can use different loss functions, you can use different optimizers. So the idea is that we can change these things and try and get a better model. So once we're done, um, the idea is that we want to evaluate the model with some key metrics. So some of the ones that are used widely are precision, recall, and accuracy. Accuracy is just it's pretty straightforward. It's just how many you got right out of the total. Um, recall is how many you were able, out of all the positive values, how many were you able to detect and finally, um, precision is out of the ones you've labeled as positive, how many are actually positive? So these are all useful for different reasons. Um, if you want to detect as many nodules as you can, you want to have a high recall. But you also don't want to sacrifice precision because at that point, you'll have a lot of false positives. So generally, in the medical domain, um, people try and focus more on recall than precision because the impact is higher, right? If you can detect someone with um, a lung nodule early on, that's very critical because it can save a life as opposed to um, if you get a false positive, it's still, um, you'll probably shock that patient. It won't be good for them, but at the same time, it's not on the same impact as just missing the nodule altogether. So the final ICNN was visualized using GradCam to understand how the model is making its decisions. And um, GradCam is basically an algorithm that uses the penultimate or the convolutional layer right before the fully connected layers. And it uses the activation from this conv layer. And it can utilize spatial information in this conv layer that's completely lost in the later dense layers. So this is a critical step to drain radiologist trusts because it can highlight discriminative regions and make the model really interpretable to domain experts. 
So I'll go into a little bit of the software and hardware I used. I used Keras and TensorFlow libraries in, in Python. So these are probably pretty popular. Um, most of you have probably worked, them, worked with them before. And I used a library called the Keras Visualization Toolkit for um, my GradCam algorithm. And I used sklearn.metrics to get the metrics for all of the, um, for the decisions and the models. And one thing is that I know um, a lot of people have to work with limited resources. So the idea is that that's why I used a, an AlexNet model as opposed to something more complicated like DenseNet or ResNet. But um, yeah, so my hardware is just a CPU on a Mac. Optimization function? I used Atom Optimizer, yeah. And that's just based on like a literature review. Um, I thought most people had good results with Atom and it had best results compared to other optimizers, so that's what I ended up going with. So now I'll go over the results, um, model performance, key metrics, and then also the visual insights that were generated. So this is the AUC. So all the CNNs had pretty good AUCs, close to one, showing that they have a good separability and they're able to perform the nodule detection task well. And the AlexNet 3D CNN with an AUC of 0.95 perform better than the AlexNet 2D CNN with 0 0.94. And uh, I can highlight more differences in the next slides, but this is just AUC. And um, my 3D CNN performed the best with an AUC of 0 0.97, which shows that these optimizations that are done over iterations and validated are effective in increasing the model classification ability. So this is a more detailed um, results slide along with the key metrics. So one thing that I really like to highlight is that this 0.94 recall value, it might only be 3% greater than the AlexNet 2D CNN, but the thing here is that even a 0 0.01 increase in recall is like saving another patient's life out of 100. So this recall value is really critical, especially if you're maintaining about the same precision, because if you're able to increase this recall without sacrificing too much in precision, you're basically finding patients that you wouldn't have otherwise found. Um, and by early detecting this lung nodule, you can approach this cancer differently and you can really make a difference in their life. So the AlexNet of the 3D CNN, the accuracy of the AlexNet 3D CNN is better than 2D CNN and the optimized 3D CNN performed the best. And it also has better recall and precision values compared to the 2D CNN. So this is probably the most critical, uh, critical part of it, the visual insights into model decision making. So the images on the left are the input images that are fed into the network. And these images on the right are the GradCam generated maps. So the idea is that if we can map this out of a full CT scan, we can show exactly what point on that huge CT scan is giving an insight into the radiologist, giving insight to the radiologist that this is what's tipping off the network and saying, this is why I'm predicting that there's a nodule here as opposed to not being a nodule. So some examples, this is pretty clearly the nodule in this case, and then now we can also detect this um, here as well, um, this one here. So these are pretty clear images, right? You can see where the nodule is, but then the real value is when it's not really clear to tell, and it's a small point on a huge CT scan, then this is really when it comes into play, because if we're able to really give visual insights into how the model's making its decisions, it just, it's a completely different ball game because now this radiologist can really trust this network and then it allows for higher adoption in the field. So um, some conclusions, 3D CNNs outperform 2D CNNs um, in this task. So it shows the benefits of using this 3D data with 3D kernels and how that can really improve um, our approach in lung nodule CT data. And state of the art accuracy numbers were achieved with the optimized 3D CNN so this indicates the effectiveness of um, the approach of building a model over multiple iterations and how it can yield high performance in terms of the lung nodule detection task. And finally, the study for the first time to my knowledge has demonstrated the effectiveness of applying gradient weighted class activation mapping and shows how it can really provide good visual explanations as to why the model is predicting what it's predicting. So this is quite critical because as I said before and many times, general general theme is that if you can really make the model interpretable, it can be really useful to clinicians and radiologists in terms of trusting the model and adopting the model. And um, 
as ML practitioners, one thing we really want to do is not just have a model that can provide high accuracies, but we really wanted to do something in the actual field. So that's why this um, grad cam analysis is so critical. So um, future work would be to review the class activation maps in detail to understand where the model is failing, where the model is performing well, and we can further optimize, further optimize the network to improve in cases where it's not doing well. And then also, um, how many of you know about capsule networks? Yeah, so capsule networks are like um, a new um, architecture that's been developed. Um, so the idea here is that traditional CNNs use max pooling to solve the problem of pose. So the problem here is that a lot of important data is lost in the process. So capsule networks use hierarchical pose relationships to store this um, relationship. And what this means is that they can train on much less data and achieve similar results. So capsule networks have shown state-of-the-art performance on data such as the MNIST data set, but I have yet to see anyone apply to the LUN module task. So this will make it a logical extension of the work that I'm doing. Um, and here are some select references um, on different things that I reviewed before I approached this problem. So any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that I manually so they give you an um where the lesions are, and then these lesions are identified as either nodule or non-nodule. So I just manually crop thirty-two by thirty-two around that to make it like a more approachable problem. Yeah, so that's the idea for adoption. So you want at least to know where the lesions are, and then you can chop it up there, and then you can identify whether there's a nodule or not. And in terms of actual CT data, you can map these drag cam explanations back onto the full image, and then provide that to the radiologist to see uh, like whether or not each block has a nodule or not. Yeah, it was a 3D crop. 32 by 32 by 32. <laughs> yeah, thanks for this uh, great session. So one question I do have, it is uh, related to, you know, uh, I think you have used those binary classification in the end to say it is like, it is a positive or is it a negative? Uh, does it make sense to include, you know, one more class where, you know, you are not sure about the results, like let's say uh, uh, the value I gave like 0.6, I'm, I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, it is in that direction. So that, that can be something, you know, which can be mm -hmm. uh, fed to or can be given to expert, like these yeah. are the results I'm not sure. Yeah, so that also makes sense. It's more similar to like a regression type problem, I mm -hmm. guess is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But that's also... Um, a valid way to approach the problem. In this case, we use binary labels, but that also makes sense because um, what we do is we get some output and then we apply the softmax to it to figure out what the um, whether it's a nodule or not. But without applying that softmax, we can get an idea of how sure the model is about its decision, and then we can output that as like a number from zero to one mm -hmm. instead of a binary classification label. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more question, which is like uh, in the initial you said like. See, these are these were the images which you can provide. But I think uh, there was some gentleman who asked, like, I can feed up a video as well, right? Which, yeah. which was just done. In that case, you said, you know, the architecture would be different. But mm -hmm. uh, if I would assume in the end you will need these images, right? So you will just take a videos and then you will just capture those images and then. In yeah, the end so you that's feed the general the idea. So I haven't done too much work on time series data, but I know that CNNs can definitely be applied. And in terms of data that comes in series like that, I know there's um, networks called recurrent neural networks or RNNs that are also um, supposed to be really good. I haven't really delved much into that area, but I know that definitely CNNs have a role to play in time series data like video as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so that healthcare data, so whatever the data we are getting so from open source or you got it from the, any hospitals? Or? Yeah, so this data, the Luna data set is open source. So okay. um, it was basically like part of a grand challenge that they released some open source data. But in terms of medical data, um, I've worked with that as well. Generally, the, the, you have to go through some um, certification before you can access this. So um, I know for 
I know what I've heard from a lot of people is that electronic health records are very good data sets to use, but at the same time, there's a lot of approval you have to go through. So the more um, closer you get to the hospital government type data sets, the more certification you'll have to go through. But there's also a lot of good open source data sets like this, which you can just find online. So that uh, 3D CNNs mainly we can use for healthcare or we can use for uh, like a sport, a sport mm -hmm. uh, recognition, sport means so that balls are above. Yeah, so 3D or, CNNs, one of the Or human action recognition, so which, uh, what are the fields we can use for 3D CNNs? Yeah, so 3D CNNs, one of the reasons they're so powerful along with other deep um, learning approaches is that they can use for anything. So anything that has an image, anything that has some kind of volume, you can apply 3D CNNs to it. So you can use it to detect literally almost anything. It's pretty much the same as our eyes. That's okay. why it's considered to be so powerful. Okay. Yeah. Convert into a vector format, right? Can I say I'm stacking like six vectors over each other? Can I say that? Yeah, that's I that I guess you can think about it like that. The idea here is that yeah, it would produce a 3D volume, and obviously you can't really see a 3D volume on a slide. So what I did is I just took one slice of it and displayed it next to a slice of the 3D image, mm -hmm. 3D volume. So a lot of the data we're talking about in this um, project is 3D data with volume with a Z axis as well. But to demonstrate it on a slide, what I did is basically I just cut out one piece of it and then so that we can show it. So I'm trying to understand like how do you put a vector format, right? Let's say for me it's like vector. Do you have like uh, six different vectors stacked at one layer? Or yeah, so it's just like, so normally you have 32 by 32 images, but in this case we'll just have 32 of those. So you just stack all these on top of one another, and that's your z-axis. So you'll just have an array of 32 by 32 images. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. The 3D model that you've worked with. Yeah, so I don't remember the exact numbers. Um, it didn't cause too much of an improvement, um, which is good in this case because it's not too big of a data set and the model's not too complex as well. But I know that um, I've experimented with this kind of stuff on bigger data sets like 80 by 80 images, 320 by 320 images, and the 3D versions of those. I know it can cause quite a jump in computational time. And one of the ways to address this is to downscale the data. And even if you don't want to downscale the data, what you can do is you can downscale it. Then you can go through multiple architectures, see what's working out, just for quicker iterations, right? You can get a quicker idea of what's working, and then you can use it on the full data set. That way, you're not wasting the time going through multiple architectures on the full data size, and you can optimize what time you have. And then another approach is just to get better hardware. I know GPU training is quite powerful, uh, TPU yes, training. We did try a few models on deep learning with respect to 3D, um, you know, mm -hmm. the input with 3D. Uh, that was basically for something called as kidney cancer detection, but we found that 3D CNN were two time consuming uh, models. Have you tried on GPU training? Yes, yes, it, it was a GPU. We basically mm. work on GPUs. So CPUs are no question because yeah. <laughs> you can't wait for the entire yeah, day exactly. to get one epoch output. So it's like GPU mm -hmm. training, but we found it two time consuming. So one approach might be just to use smaller data, get quicker iterations, and then you can scale up to the full data size and then yeah. apply. Yeah, so your accuracy might decrease, but what I'm saying is that if you downscale like this, then you can see what's getting better accuracies in relation to other architectures. And once you've realized this architecture is what's working for me, DenseNet's working better than ResNet, then you can full scale back up to the full data size, and then I'll try it on that. Since you're working with hospitals, right, are you trying to evaluate your model against your real-time data before going further into your analysis? Yeah, so future work would be to basically try and talk to a hospital, see if they can implement this solution. I haven't really gotten that far yet, but uh, that would be definitely um, something I'd want to do. Last question. Don't you think uh, chopping 32 by 32 box into an entire city image, you are losing the global information where the nodule is? Because radiologists, they look where those nodules are. So when you make small boxes, the global information is lost. So generally, I feel like nodules are pretty self-contained. So the spatial information you want to look at is like within the nodule itself, right, in this case, because um, there's a lot of things that exist in CT scan data that's just not a nodule. And there's um, 
So what you want to do is you want to look at this nodule and figure out whether it's a nodule or not. And that's how you approach the false positive problem. And um, the problem is, is that like, you want to get this full spatial information. But generally, nodules are pretty self-contained. Because if we can get the whole nodule in one chop of the data, then you can pretty much figure out whether it's a nodule or not without much spatial information from other parts of the CT scan. So in this case, I don't think it's too much of a problem. I guess it's something to be explored, um, whether using the full CT scan can allow for better accuracies. But in this case, I don't think it caused too much of an issue. Awesome. Thanks, Logan. All right, thank you. Thank you.